introduction to clinical medicine by Professor Kate Eaker, 2003 Nobel laureate for chemistry. The lecture is organized by Thailand Research Fund, Thai Academy of Science and Technology, and Faculty of Science in the University, and the Bridges Dialogue Towards a Culture of Peace program, supported by International Peace Foundation. First of all, I would like to invite Professor Ilwat Kudlong, Director of Thailand Research Fund, to deliver an opening address. Region 
uh, as a backpacker, and it's been many weeks uh, around this region. I was asking him at lunch, uh, how, was he back before then? We thought then and here, it was uh, 30 years, we have to see. He said, it, it's, and during the trip that he took during going to Laos, Angkor Wat, uh, uh, Cambodia, Pakistan, and other places in Asia, I think, make him uh, a well-traveled person. So uh, we welcome him back again. This time, a little bit different from backpacking uh, visit uh, a few years back. This time, he was treated uh, hopefully quite well by uh, our host here, Mr. Christian. So uh, welcome back again to Thailand. And I do hope that the next time you come will not be as long as space before the first time in this time that, that you visit us. Uh, we do very much uh, look forward to enjoy your lecture. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone will uh, be able to gain something from this lecture. I'm sure that <laughs> being an excellent lecture as it is, uh, we will certainly learn a lot from this lecture. So please welcome uh, our Nobel, Nobel laureate for 2003, Professor Peter Abra, who will give a lecture on our foreign water channels. Professor Peter Abra, please. Well, thank you for the gracious introduction and, and for the, the uh, splendid hospitality. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, amongst your distinguished faculty, your, your dignitaries, and the wonderful young people here at Mahidong University. So I have many to thank. The, the university itself, Mahidong, the International Peace Foundation, the Dialogues Program, uh, for the organization of this, and the, the Thai Science Fund, which contributes precious dollars to special research activities here in Thailand. I think Thailand is very special, particularly in the region, Southeast Asia, but I think as, as the years go by, the, the role of Thailand in silence will grow. We have, over the years, had a number of one, wonderful young Thais come to Johns Hopkins, and I, I think the, the roles that you play in science worldwide will be increasingly important. So the topic of my talk today, the aquifer and water channels, is something that um, our laboratory has been pursuing now for about 15 years. Think for a moment about your own body. It's primarily water. Science students all know this. I think the general public forgets about this. I'm a 75 kilogram man. Uh, about 50 kilograms of that are water. Water is the most abundant uh, component of all of the cells and all of the tissues of my body. And the same is true of each of you. Most organisms are, or I should say, organisms are mostly composed of water. This is true of higher animals, lower vertebrates, invertebrates, microorganisms, and plant, plants. They're mostly water. And so water is oftentimes referred to as the solvent of life. Without water, there is no life. Now complex organisms will move fluids from one compartment to another. And this is essential. Think for a moment. If a foreign body lodges in the outer surface of your eye, you will almost immediately secrete tears to wash it clear to keep it from damaging your cornea. If you're challenged with temperature, high temperature, you will sweat to cool your body. Constitutively, the choroid plexus in your brain releases spinal fluid, which is primarily water. Our kidneys will concentrate a large volume of primary urine to the small volume of urine that we release each day. And these, these physiological functions are familiar to all of us. Other organisms also use these water channel proteins, microorganisms, to avoid osmotic shock, freeze damage, plants to take up water from the ground to release water into the atmosphere. So the proteins I'm going to tell you about, the aquaporins, really function very simply as a cellular equivalent to a plumbing system. They allow water to cross barriers to move where it needs to go. Now, when we, we became uh, interested in, the, in these studies, we had the tremendous advantage 
of joining a field that had been looked at for, for a number of decades by very, very distinguished and very dedicated biophysicists and physiologists. And they considered the problem of moving water across cell-cell boundaries. But of course, it is the, uh, the plasma membrane, the outer surface of the cell, that pro provides the primary barrier of moving water across biological compartments. And it was predicted correctly in the 1920s when the lipid bilayer, so this is Pentra is a lipid bilayer, see the, the polar heads of phospholipid molecules, the hydrophobic tails, and then here is the second leaflet, the hydrophobic tails associated in the polar heads. So we have the outer surface of a cell, the inner surface of the cell. And it was, it was predicted correctly that water could diffuse back and forth, forth across these membranes. Now the dedicated biophysicists that I mentioned saw the problem with a greater clarity because they thought, well, diffusion may explain the movements in many tissues, but it doesn't explain the movements in tissues that have massive water permeability, such as you know, tubules, secretory glands, and red cells, or in, in other species, for example, plants, the rootlets of the plants, to move water rapidly. And so they predicted correctly that there must be water-selective channels. We now know these as the aquifer water channels. And the current view is that both pathways exist. Diffusion, diffusion in all tissues, water channels in special tissue. There are some functional differences. Diffusion is at low capacity, bidirectional event, whereas water channels have a high capacity for water and very limited movement of other solutes. No detectable movement of protons, acid, in the form of the hydronium and the H3O plus. And this function of difference is quite important because our kidneys will reabsorb up to about 180 liters of water per day from the primary urine. If we didn't reabsorb this, we would die of dehydration. If we reabsorb water plus acid, we would become systemically acidotic. So these, these distinctions are quite important. But the movement of the fluid is directed by the osmotic gradients. So water either enters cells or leaves cells depending on the direction of the gradient. So this process of osmosis that we all learned about when we were young, youngsters in, in, in primary school, in biological tissues, but osmosis occurs very rapidly because of the water channels. There's some other physical differences that are known as inhibitors of, of the diffusion event, whereas Robert Macy at the University of California in 1970 discovered that mercurials would inhibit water channels. Removal of the mercurials restores the activity of water channels. It has a lower radius activation energy. So they knew a lot about the behavior of the channels and the membranes. But most scientists did not believe they existed because no one had identified water channel proteins, isolated them, cloned them, expressed them, and studied them. The proof of their existence is what caused most scientists to be skeptical that they really existed. And our laboratory played a, played a role in the discovery of these. And this, this role, it, it, it should be stressed to the students, was the role of sheer serendipitous observation, a sheer accident. I'm originally a, uh, a hematologist. I was trained in internal medicine and, and was studying the RH blood group antigen. Now, RH antigens are very important clinically. I suspect that every, every woman in the audience knows about RH because of the importance they play in pregnancy. RH negative mothers, if they become pregnant with an RH positive baby, and about 15% of you are RH negative, could become sensitized. Very fundamental. In the, in the years when we started these studies, about 15 years ago, the RH was not understood at a molecular level. And we developed a method to biochemically purify RH, a 32 kilodalt polypeptide. And what we have here is a sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel. Samples are applied to the top. Electrophoretic currents draw them in, they're stained with silver reagents. Now, first off, we purified this protein from human red cells. We found I, uh, very similar proteins in rat and cow and other species. So the core polypeptide of RH is fundamental. The antigen is something special for some humans. Now, by surprise, we purify a second protein of almost the same size, 28 kilodons, just a little different. And we initially dismissed this as a proteolytic fragment, a breakdown product. But that was, that was incorrect. 